We use a lot of uh, mix of uh, library material at first to kind of get together a, a character of the gun uh, and kind of the general sound that we want it that we want it to have and portray. And once we feel that we have that uh, down, we then we can go to a list of weapons to then go and record them live. And we'll be doing a lot more uh, live recording uh, with the weapons this time around. Typically, you know, most of the gun sounds are extracted from if you do live records from outdoor environments. Uh, we've been experimenting a little bit with using um, indoor sounds and mixing those with characteristics of outdoor sounds. Just a couple of different approaches just to give them a new flavor, um, uh, trying to get out of that um, sort of box of this is how you create a weapon. Uh, one of the components uh, of a weapon, uh, it's kind of a little sound design trick that someone taught me a long time ago, uh, is uh, the actual sound of the trigger being pulled, just that little dry click and those, those little mechanical noises. And, and that, that tends to be what actually makes this gun sound gritty, not the blast. Um, the blast of the weapon is pretty much just volume. Like it's just, it, they almost all sound the same to a certain degree. So as a little psychological trick, uh, we'll do things where we'll place uh, some of that trigger noise, maybe 100 to 150 milliseconds before the actual blast of the gun. And while you don't perceive this, uh, or I should say you perceive it, you don't notice it, um, you hear that click every single time the gun fires off and it implies mechanical movement, moving parts. And the bigger we make that mechanical noise, the, more, the larger the gun and chunkier the gun kind of feels like. And so you'll notice this time around that uh, in some of the bandit themed weapons, which are all kind of homemade, just kind of things glommed onto each other to make them, uh, that they'll all have that characteristic, the kind of real rattly, big, bombastic uh, type nature to them. In BO1, um, it was a lot more desert area, so uh, we kind of had to come up with different things to, to hook onto uh, to, to create different themes. But with this, um, you know, you go from snow to lush grassy areas to dams to whatever, um, and, and all of those feel different. So it's, it's, it's great for music support, which, um, you know, BL1 had music, ambient music, as well as combat music in, in this game will too. As far as the uh, sound effects themselves, um, it, it really helps uh, things come alive because you're not reliant upon wind and falling rocks all the time. Uh, <laughs> so you can, you can, you know, plants and trees and leaves and all these kinds of things can be mixed into the world to make it feel uh, more alive. And, um uh, additionally, one of the other is aspects here is that um, rather than just the environment alone, uh, there's going to be a lot more uh, character development and important pivotal characters involved throughout the game. And that's going to give us an opportunity uh, that, we, that we weren't able to fully exploit on the first Borderlands of recurring themes and these recurring melodies being associated with certain people and, and getting that musical support uh, to the story that, that's, being, that's being written. BL1 um, was great in the sense that, that it kind of established this sort of quirky, over-the-top character line. People really grabbed onto it, and it wasn't oversaturated to the point to where people were, were trying to get away from dialogue. So I think this time we can really, we can really focus in on, on developing a little more story and, um, and actually using some of the new, the new characters as well as the old characters in creative ways and telling some backstory and you know, things like that. So yeah, it, it's, kind of, it, it's kind of worked out to be you know, a great approach. And uh, we've also been doing a lot of talking of actually having the characters have interaction between each other mm -hmm. as well. So um, we'll take that to the next logical step of, they used to comment on what happened in the game and throw that out into the world. Now, one of the other characters might say something back. Uh, so that opens up a whole lot of new opportunities. Yeah, which is great because it kind of, it helps connect the player um, much more to what's going on in the world because they feel like there's actually dynamic things happening with the, with the characters and with the dialogue. I use my hands a lot. <laughs> One of the, the interesting things that we're going to be able to do as well is uh, we'll be able to prioritize what audio is coming through the mix, basically. And so if, uh, beforehand, uh, every monster that was fighting you was always making it sound, so we had to try and uh, anticipate which sounds would be more important than others and which situations and so we'll try to just hit a baseline there to get you know at least 70 percent of the time it's you're hearing what you need to hear uh, so we'll be allowed what we'll be able to do now is that when there's an important monster roar or a huge attack is about to happen we can take all the other audio that's not important at that moment bring it down which makes that standout moment or attack 
uh, even that much more impactful, and you'll feel like it's hitting even harder. Uh, so our goal is our goal is to make everything uh, in Borderlands um, as aggressive as it was before, um, and to even hit just that much harder. Yeah, and, you know. Yeah, take it a notch up. <laughs> <laughs>